Okay, so I think we'll we'll get started. Um, so I maybe I think what I'll should go first. <laughs> okay, well, I, what I'd have you each do is is just take a few minutes and, and tell us a little bit about um, how you got involved in the commercial fishing industry. Um, and this is see. Jessica. <laughs> I was 19 and in college at University of Vermont studying history. And I was in a band, and the guitarist kept having his friend from Fairhaven come up and visit. Um, and his family owns a bunch of boats, and he was bragging about making all kinds of money fishing. So, really. <laughs> so I drove down to New Bedford by myself, never been there before. And um, he showed me around his uncle's boat where he was on deck. And I'd never seen a fishing boat before. I am from Presque Isle, Maine, completely landlocked potato country. <laughs> Nobody fishes or even knows anything about the ocean in my family, so it was kind of weird. Um, so it showed me around, and I thought it would be a good summer job. So um, went down the next day, and he made me uh, cold call the docks by myself. <laughs> Go find a job, Jess. Okay. So um, I went up. Yeah. I went on the Quincy too. I saw a woman, I was like, yes, there's Eva. I'll go ask her for a job. <laughs> and um, they laughed me off the boat and told me to go work on a day boat. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went back in my vehicle and cried a little bit. And then um, I decided to try again and I saw Dave Wilhelmson standing on the Legacy, smoking a cigarette and he looked pretty chill. So I was like, I'll, I'll try this guy. <laughs> so I went over there and somehow convinced him that I knew how to do any kind of physical labor. I did the house painting before and stuff, and then I had my UVM sweatshirt on, and that struck up a conversation about his son was gonna go there. I was like, thank you. <laughs> so he ended up giving me a shot anyway. He's pretty open-minded about girls working on boats and stuff, and I've uh, been there ever since. So that was 2006, so it's been 15 years. And um, this year will be my 16th season, I think. Wow. Um, so I worked on deck for four years, I believe, three and a half, four years. And then we needed a new mate, so um, he trained me as mate. I did that for two and a half, three years. Um, he trained me engineer, so I've been doing that forever. Um, and then he got sick with uh, COPD um, eight, nine years ago. So he put me in the chair and let me take the boat, and I've been running it since then. So. Mm -hmm. wow. That's That's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> did you ever, sorry. Did you ever finish your degree, or did you say I don't I really did. need it? I did. I fished a um, couple of summers. I took a year off and fished like three quarters of a year, and went back to school and finished my degree. And then um, I graduated in '09 after the crash, and there was no jobs, so I just kept. <laughs> so and it, it kind of stuck with me. <laughs> and Eva, who you mentioned, um, I, I don't know where she is these days. She would be a wonderful person to bring in. So Eva's, yes. I'll stand up again so you can get a reference. Eva's about my height, right? Mm -hmm. Piercing blue eyes. She came here from Poland. And the story that she told me is that she came to go to art school and needed a way to pay for it and yeah. got a job in the fishing industry, ended up rising up to the captain of the Quincy Two, which is an offshore scholar, um, and basically never looked back. I don't know if she finished her degree, but I think she I fell think in she love did. with fishing. Did she? Yeah. She was very smart. <laughs> So, I'm sure you are too. <laughs> <laughs> so Tammy, tell us, your, your story's a little different, I think. I guess it would be a lot different. In that, um, so my whole family, commercial fishermen, like my great grandpa, my father, my father was a scallopper, my grandfather was a scallopper, um, one of them was a dragger. My two sons that are standing back there, they're both, I don't, I gotta brag a little. So my son Hudson is like one of the youngest captains on the East Coast. And then yeah. my son is mate and engineer. So yeah, so our whole family. And so I grew up in a house where my father was a scholar, but, but um, he did not like his job. He did it because he had dropped out of school and needed a job that could provide for a family. And it seemed to be the industry that you could make a living without an education, but he so hated it. So he would always tell my brothers, don't go fishing. You need to get an education. I don't want you to go fishing. I don't want you to go fishing. Um, and so my parents didn't allow 
my older brother to go fishing until he graduated from high school because they were afraid if he got a taste for the money, maybe he would drop out of school. Um, so he did go fishing, got a taste for the money, um, and he stayed in it um, until he was lost at sea. It'll be four years. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, one second. And then my younger brother, they let him try going fishing before um, when he was in high school, and he despised it. He's like, there's no way I'm going to be shucking this collar for the rest of my life. You felt like you lose your brain cells doing it. That's his theory. So he went and got a degree in engineering. And so when I got married, um, my father never talked to me about not going fishing because I was a girl and nobody did it, right? But when I got married, um, the day we actually got married, um, my ex-husband now bought, bought the fishing boat. We literally were at the um, bank prior to getting married later that day to sign, put the house up for the boat. Um, but he never really had experience in the pilot house. So I started fishing with him just out of necessity. Nobody else really wanted to go. <laughs> was like, um, like, he really, he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know. So that's the reality of it. So it was like, um, well, Tammy, so I'm like, sure. And so when that <laughs> did happen, my father came down the docks. My God, he was so sad. He was crying, saying like, I never thought I'd have to tell my daughter not to go fishing. <laughs> I can't believe this is happening. And so he was really sad at first, but then as time went on and people would be like, hey, my God, you bought that boat with the girls? Cause my sister-in-law fished with us too. Like, that's unbelievable. And then he was like, yeah, that's my daughter. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he, got really, he got really proud about it, yeah. which was really nice. Um, and so I did it for, to pay for my, because I had already, we had got, mar got married, but I was in college, so I did it to pay for uh, my college. So I did summer and winter break. Like winter break, we used to fish Boston Harbor, which is disgusting. I can't believe they let us fish there. Um, but it, I have to say it's the absolute best summer job in the world. Like, I think so. Yeah, you pay your whole year's expenses. Yeah, you do. And it's just, I love being on the ocean. That's what it is. Oh, she makes me happy. Um, a couple of years, I, I'm dating a fisherman now, and so I decided to go on days fishing with him too. It's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never been scalloping. I've always been, I mine is just dragging. But that, so I got out of, out of necessity and just kind of fell in love with it, and I would still do it. Um, but not the whole year. <laughs> I'm a so, special ed teacher in the, in the spare time. I teach special ed. Oh, how so, wonderful. Yeah. So for the, maybe the uninitiated, um, dragging is another word for ground fishing. Um, so that's catching fish, but you know. Um, and there are, I don't even remember, how many species of fish, Phil, are caught by ground fish boats? Phil's <laughs> disappearing, he doesn't. Phil's <laughs> retired. A lot. No. <laughs> like 19 <laughs> species or something in the, so ground fish meaning the fish that swim sort of in the lower column of water. Um, they're caught with a net. If you turn around, kind of suspended over there mm -hmm. is a, a ground fish net that's about a 1 30th scale. So 30 times as big. It's towed behind the boat. The fish fill are funneled in. They're caught in the end of that net. Um, so that's dragging. Scalloping is obviously fishing for scallops, right? Mm -hmm. So cut two different fisheries. Um, so what I thought I'd have you each do now is just Give us a sense of a typical day. And obviously, you know, for you, this is thinking back to what it was like in, in yeah, the 80s. Yeah, because it was 1984. <laughs> so 84 to 89. I actually, not to, I actually fished till I was almost five months pregnant with my oldest son back there. <laughs> Me too. Did you? Yeah. Right. yeah. When we were taking out, I'd be down the fish hole, my belly would be like this, and I'd be like trying to push it back up there. <laughs> because I wasn't tall enough to actually reach in the back of the, the um, pens. So I'd like jump up and I used to, I really felt at the time that you had to work twice as hard because they'd be like, who's in the hole? I'll go to fish it. And I'd make sure that I had everything set so the fish were coming up quickly so they couldn't say, oh, is it that girl? Well, <laughs> that's definitely true. You have to prove yourself over and over and over and over again to every single new person that comes on the boat because they're going to instantly doubt you. But it's a little easier when you have the title behind you now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm the charge, so watch. <laughs> <laughs> That's my way to the highway. <laughs> we can start in with questions, and then I do want to hear about a typical day. You're <laughs> in the wheelhouse, it's your boat, and you still got to prove yourself to that deckhand? Sometimes. 
just get attitude. Yeah, okay, just want to mm -hmm. clarify. I that. think a lot of it comes with uh, experience and my attitude and confidence yeah. kind of plays on that too. It's like the more confident I have become, the less I have to deal with that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is the crew of, um, on your boat mostly all men? Or? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever had a woman on the crew? Um, Dave took another couple of girls um, as deckhands through the years. Um, there is a woman named Sarah. She used to go meet um, on the Resolute. Um, she also was a drag or two. And uh, there was another woman that was a observer. She did a few trips. Um, she also went out pregnant, observing. <laughs> so, and observing is one of the ways I think women often get into fishing. Yeah. And can you explain what an observer is? Um, so they work for NMFS, National Marine Fisheries Service, and they get selected to do certain fishing trips. Um, we all have to take an observer once or twice a year. Um, they just count how many fish we catch by accident, by catch, and um, make sure our gear is all proper and stuff like that and um, so they have to cut a few scallops as part of their job to measure them and see how, how the stock is doing and stuff like that so through that then some of them catch on that they could be making more money if they went on deck <laughs> instead of observing so they start trying to get on <laughs> yeah so. Let's pause for a second. There are quite a few of you standing, so I would offer there are four chairs up front if anybody would like, and there also are some more chairs we could pull. We're happy to have you. I promise we don't fight. <laughs> um, okay, so talk us through sort of a once you're, well, talk us through how, how does the trip begin? Kind of well, what happens? Um, for my boat, I live in Maine, so I drive down for each trip, so I try to get all of my gear work and prep stuff done in one day and then leave the next day. Um, that way I don't have to drive back and forth, but it doesn't always work out. Um, <laughs> so I have to order grub for the trip. Um, oh, let's see, all the gear, we have to fix up our dredge and our chain bags and everything and make sure everything's in good shape. Um, get gear supplies we need for the trip. Um, we need fuel and ice and water and all the stuff that we need for the trip. Um, usually it takes a day or two to get everything ready. And then when the weather looks good, we head out. And um, sometimes we're going right close to shore. Sometimes we're out in Georgia's banks, 160 miles out. So we could be steaming for six hours or 24 hours, depending where you're going. We used to have to go way down off the coast of uh, Virginia to Delmarva area, and that was like 28-hour <laughs> steam. <laughs> so you're kind of bored just sitting around waiting to get there, and then um, we run watches. So the crew gets split in half. Um, I have my guys, and then the mate has his guys, and that way the boat is continuously running. We don't lay up for the night or anything. Um, you gotta make the most out of every minute you're on the boat. Um, we're regulated to seven men on most trips. Um, closed area trips, we can take eight. So um, there's uh, me, two guys, and then a swing guy. And he does half one watch and half the other watch. And the same for the meat's watch. And um, yeah, once we get there, we set out the gear and make a tow. We usually tow for 50 minutes, depending if we're loading up, we'll, if there's a lot of scallops, we'll make shorter toes. Um, but yeah, it depends where we, where we are, what kind of fishing it is. Sometimes we have to tow nonstop, and other times we can just make one tow a watch and just lay up and cut. So it's different types of fishing and what you're doing. Um, but if you're towing steady, you make like a you tow for 50 minutes or so, haul back. Um, couple guys that on, go out on deck and handle the gear depending on the weather that can be pretty sketchy sometimes um, they're just swinging back and forth all over the place <laughs> um, and then you dump it out on deck and then put them back over the rail set them back out and then the guys start picking the pile so you just bend over and pick scallops 
into your basket and kick out the bycatch and junk and sand and depending on your luck that toe you might have a, a pile to the rails of sand dollars <laughs> or sand or rocks or whatever so it depends where you are what it's like it's very different every place you go is totally different bottom what you catch can be completely different like trip to trip or area to area or toe to toe sometimes so it's always keeping everybody on their feet and it can be exciting it can be very boring <laughs> So after picking the pile, then you... Then they take the time. baskets into the cutting area and dump them in the box. A basket of scallops can be 60 to 80 pounds, probably. Um, I always have to use my leg. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do that. You just cut, 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 and then cut as much as you can, as fast as you can, until the next toe comes back. And, if, and then you just do that over and over and over again you get your weight or you run out of your fishing days and I don't know if people realize but when they talk about watches it's not like you do the watch I mean you do the watch then you get a little break but it's not that how much sleep are you getting I guess is what I'm getting so uh, it depends on the boat My, yeah. I do ten and a half and five and a half so we have a ten and a half hour watch and then you have five and a half hours to eat and um, whatever you want to do sleep Usually I get three, maybe four hours of sleep, um, then you're back out. A lot of the boats now are doing 12 and fours, so that's 12 hours on deck, four hours off, they usually get two hours of sleep, so it's pretty intense. And that goes on for seven to 10 days? Up to 14, 14 days. some guys are up to 16, 18 days, it depends what they're doing. Susan. So do you have a cook on board, or who does the cooking? That's a thing of the past. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, when they used to be able to take 12-man crews, there would be a dedicated cook. Uh -huh. uh, but now, since we we had to cut back to seven, you don't have, you can't do that anymore. So I cook for my watch, and the mate cooks for his watch. Um, we we are pretty good on my boat. And a lot of home cooked meals, meat and potatoes kind of stuff. Um, but whatever is easy to throw in the oven and I can, you know, get the meal on the table quick and um, start sloshing all over the galley. <laughs> so, yeah. so Tammy, take us through kind of a typical dragon trip. Yeah, so yeah, it's a little different. And also, I was just on, um, it was only four men for a while, two, for a while it was two women and two men. Right? Um, but it wasn't day fishing. We didn't go day dragging. We did trip fishing, so we would be gone seven to eight days. Um, so you would just ice off, you know, ice off. Um, not only, I get to be the mate and the cook. Um, and little did I know that the cook really wasn't supposed to make three meals a day. I got tricked into that. I was told to make breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, if that's what you're supposed to do, that's what I did, right? But no, that's not what you're supposed to do. Um, so we would, you know, um, I saw, I'd go through the groceries, you know. I will say that I never learned how, I only fished summers and winter breaks, so I never learned how to mend or not. I just would fill the needles and hand them to my husband or the other that guy that could mend, so I would do that. But I feel I made up for it with all the other stuff they had me do that I wasn't supposed to. Um, and then um, we'd go out, and depending on the area that you're fishing, you would like sometimes, and I, we fluke fish, so it's a flat bottom summer, a summer thing. Um, and you could do a tow from like an hour and a half to the record tow I had was six and a half hours. Wow. Yeah, six and a half hours and I was crazy. I did never want to hang up. So I would stand up the whole time and make sure that I was staying on the plotter line. My husband would say like, uh, hey, you know, you, you can you know, kind of move around a little, you know, check the areas out. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. So I would stay on the bottom, make sure I stayed, I stood up the whole time, six and a half hours looking back like, oh, I don't want to hang up, don't want to hang up as if you get caught on like a, something, a, a wreck or something and like the whole boat, and you're like, ugh, I hate that feeling. Um, so that one particular toe, like honestly in dragging the most exciting thing is to go out and pick the pile because you're like, what did we get? Like how many fish, you know, how many fish, baskets of fish? So that one toe, so you go out, you know, you'd haul back, you drop the net, um, and then we'd set back out before you start picking. So I'd be excited, like, okay, I'd come back out because I'd be in the pilot house setting out, I'd come back out, and this that one toe, I'd come out, and I'm like, what? 
<laughs> there was nothing to pick because it was six and a half baskets of jumbo fluke. That's wow. all because we were using rollers. And I'm like, the most exciting thing. I stood out there for six and a half hours <laughs> and I didn't even get to pick one fish. I was so disappointed. So then um, that particular, it was kind of funny because then it, it was my husband's turn to go. And he's like, well, are you tired? If you're not tired, like, you, you can go up to the pilot house again if you're not. I'm like, no, I don't know, maybe I'm. So he said, all right, go lay down. So he's up there, the one who wants to like maneuver, like let me find some different areas. I'm in my bunk probably 20 minutes and then all of a sudden and he hung up. I'm like, are you kidding me? You have six and a half hours of straight sleep and now I'm getting already. So if you hang up, everybody goes on deck. There's only four people, so it's not running watches. You know, they're in the bunk. If you're like, my husband was telling the other guys, if I was in the pilot house, cause he broke me and me pretty much the second trip, I think. Cause I said it was necessity. He didn't really have the very first trip that he made his grandfather came with him to kind of, and he did that for a little bit to kind of break him in. And then um, a lot of guts to buy a boat with not really having any experience, but hey. Um, so anyway, so then you would pick the pile, put it down, and you just did that round the clock, you know? And then you would, if, if the guys were, if you were towing, they were sleeping. If they were towing, you got to sleep. But the, the other guys got to sleep whenever, because if you weren't me or, um, and uh, captain, then you got to sleep in between. So, and in the summer was nice, you could actually lay out and get a tan. So not only were you making money, you're getting a tan, <laughs> and you're getting it, right? I only and did if, farmer tan. Oh, yeah, <laughs> no, in between, because if you were going like four hours, you could like, um, and then if it was really, we never were out for horrible weather, like scallops or anything. I mean, drag was offshore too, but if it was really nasty, we'd go into Nantucket, which was usually nice, except, you know, we were there with that junky clothes, so it wasn't wonderful. <laughs> anyway, so, and that's kind of how it was. That's what it'd be, and you just do that. So what'd you do with the baby? When the baby came, did the baby go on board? So, no. So I don't know what, how you ended up. So what happened? So when I, because like I said, I was doing it for my education. So after I had my son, like I was in, had gotten into graduate, I was in graduate. So the first trip, I really, he was born in February. And in June, I'm like, okay, I'll try make a trip. I cried for three days straight. Oh, yeah. My husband's like, this is not gonna work. <laughs> I back home, and I just could not bring myself to ever go out again. Oh my gosh! I just couldn't. And then I have my degree in education, so I taught. But really, since they were little, they would go out on the boat. So, um, you know, if we went out just for a couple of days, and not that this is relevant, but I have to say, one of my favorite anniversaries. So when my youngest son, um, I, I don't know if it was maybe 10 or whatever, we went out um, fishing for the day because he loved it. He was born to be a fisherman. But anyway, we went out for the day um, and the boat ended up breaking down. So we had to go into Minutia, right? Yes. So it happened to be our anniversary. Oh. And the people say, oh, what'd you do for your anniversary? I'm like, well, we went to Minutia, <laughs> we went out to eat, and then we, slept, we stayed out on, on a boat. The reality was we were in all nasty clothes because we didn't bring any good clothes. The boat broke down. We did walk up to the corner with our fish boots on to get some to eat. And then we laid down. You remember that, Hudson? Then we laid down the table that turned into a bunk and the three of us slept on it together. And it was one of the best experiences. So, so the whole, it's a family. Like I said, they're fourth generation fishermen, so. Wow, it's great. Mm. Yes. So, um... There's a lot of uh, fish that have been overfished. So, what, what's the uh, you know the future of scallops? Do they just are they like rabbits or they just uh, are they like uh, rabbits? Or, is it going to be a time when they're uh, well, less and less scallops? They were on the brink, and that's why they brought in the, the regulation. Um, I'm not sure the technical name of it, but the they had a moratorium for a while and then they made all these closed areas so that um, they could let scallops, young scallops grow in certain places. And so every year they do surveys now and they see where the seeds are coming out and they'll close off those areas to protect the young stuff so they can grow up. I, I think they're still learning about how scallops seed and move around the ocean. Um, but right now it's pretty, it's pretty well managed as far as keeping the stock going 
and the observer is industry funded that also helps with that so i think the industry working with the scientists and the government is trying to keep it going for everybody's benefit <clears throat> there are quite a few regulatory <coughs> things so there's i mean as she said there's the closed area piece of it um scallops are fished with a a net essentially it's called we call it a dredge but it's made of steel rings that are linked together the rings are regulation size so they're now i believe four, four inches, inches. Um, you know <coughs> earlier on before regulations they could they were very small i think they were two and a half inches and they gradually increased them so more of the small scallops can fall through um, the reduced crew size potential is intended to reduce the effort i mean i think that people just work a lot more <laughs> yeah. um, so there, there are those those things as well. Um, yes. Now, how many days a year is your permit allow you to do scallops? And that's another piece. It changes every year. They decide how much uh, we can safely catch without harming the species. Mm -hmm. um, this year we have 24 open area days. That's it. 24. Yep. And then we also have three closed area trips this year, which are 15,000 pounds each. So it's a little bit of a slack year coming up this year, but it's not always bad because the price goes up. Price went up a lot. I would notice. Yeah, uh, <laughs> like double. <We> like that. <laughs> yeah. different than I mean, like when my father, when I was a little girl, my father, ten days. He was out 10 days, you came in, you took out, you you know, did your gear work and all that stuff. You had like maybe two or three days and then you were back out and it was year round, 10 days, five days in, but those five days you really weren't in. And then he was usually miserable the first day because he just got in miserable yeah. the day before he was going out because he had to go out. So he had two good days out of him if he wasn't drunk. But his, yeah. 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 They used to go out. Like Dave, the my boat owner, he always talked about it was eight days out, five days home, eight days out all year. The only um, holiday they had free was Christmas. It didn't matter what anything else was. So there's a lot of heavy drinkers. <laughs> yes, yeah. <clears throat> can you can you stagger like the the fleet itself for the industry? Can you stagger your 25 days with other boats so there's fishing 365 days a year for that product? I don't think you can exchange open area days. You can exchange closed area trips. Um, is that what you mean? Well, no, so so they fish in the area year round. I mean, are, are people scalloping year round? So there's a year round. Yeah, you're given the days for a year. Um, right. right. Yeah, okay. The allocation they is They give you year. new days for the year April 1st, and then you have all year to use them oh, okay. into the next year. Um, you can exchange closed area trips with other boats if you want that area and they you know, they want to trade you can do stuff like that um, a lot of the crews now because there's so little fishing time compared to the old days um, you'll have two boats with one crew sometimes even three boats some people are crazy and do four boats but <laughs> um, so that way the, the guys they do work most of the year because um, they have twice as many trips to get done. I just I just work the one boat. So. <clears throat> have you had some experiences in, in weather, stormy weather? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we've been out in 50 knots plus a couple of times. Usually if it's given over 20 foot seas, I'm probably going to head home. Um, depends what the situation is, how long the storm's going to last. I really only stopped fishing for one storm, and then you just drive back and forth in the weather and wait it out. Um, a lot of guys will go into Nantucket or lay to somewhere near the wind and just wait. Um, depends what your situation is, how far from home you are. We've gone into Cape May before for weather. Um, kind of just decide what's the best uh, course of action for what you have coming at you. <laughs> have you ever had to put a survival suit on in a, in a storm situation or emergency? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have. <laughs> um, we had a group of New Bedford Vogue students here uh, this morning, starting at eight o'clock this morning, and um, so usually when we have teenagers here, we do a number of things, but the the day usually ends with a survival suit experience, um, which is something that. 
you know, you fishermen practice this. Mm -hmm. It's a life and death kind of thing, so you need to be able to do it quickly and well. And, and yeah, then, we do drills to just yeah. keep it fresh. Try to get so a survival suit. If you can see the mannequin in the back there, mm -hmm. it's called a survival suit or an immersion suit. It'll keep you somewhat warm and, and floating, um, hopefully until you get rescued. And uh, it's not easy to put on. Fishermen try to do it in under a minute or two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you do if there's a health uh, crisis? Um, the crew. You call the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. You're required to report <clears throat> major injuries and stuff like that. Um, they have a surgeon that they'll put you on with and they'll take a account of all the symptoms or what the problem yeah. is and then tell you what to do um, sometimes it's okay head home head to nantucket or we're going to airlift you yeah. airlift the guy or whatever it depends on what how severe it is and time time wise or where you are in the ocean so i haven't had to have anybody airlifted myself um, i've had to bring people in a few times but it's just it's an unfortunate thing that you you can't get immediate medical care. So it was one thing that was a little bit stressful when I was pregnant out there because you're okay. you're out there and it's, something goes wrong. You kind of. So how long did you fish? I'm sorry for interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> so you fished you a half. I was five and a half months along. Yeah, my daughter Isla. She's six. She's Oh. And how do you do that? Like, how do you leave her to go fishing? Isn't that um, she stays really with her dad while I'm gone. He's a good dad, and mm -hmm. so we have a good co-parenting situation. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, it was really hard going oh, out. Oh, right? Did you not cry? That's yeah, like, oh, it was hard going back to work, but mm -hmm. Dave was awesome. He let I so um, I fished all of my allotted trips for the year by July that year. So I could get everything done, so I could stop being pregnant fishing. <laughs> so I didn't want to stay out there past six months because I was worried about the noise of the boat harming the baby and all that stuff. So plus, it was just getting really hard to lift my leg over the rail. They <laughs> 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 had to make a ladder for me to get off the boat. <laughs> so I got yelled at a few times for greasing the blocks and jumping on the rails, and they were like, "We'll do that. We'll do that. Get down." <laughs> I'm like, Sorry, I'm just used to doing everything. So um, I wanted to get everything done as fast as possible. So I went and did all my trips. I stayed home for five days and went back out. <clears throat> so it was intense. Um, got them all done. And then I had the whole rest of the winter off. And she was born in November. And then Dave was amazing. He's like, just go back to work whenever you want. So I was like, OK. <laughs> so I was able to stay home with her till she was six months. And then I went back to work and started that year a little bit late. And it worked out great. Well, I, I was going to ask for a question too. Oh, <laughs> you can go first. Find, is it easy or hard to find crew members now? I I find it kind of difficult, um, but it's I have an older boat and I, we only have the one boat in our company. So a lot of the guys, a lot of the really good guys, want two boats. They want to make money, money, money. So sometimes I have a little bit of a hard time, but I do manage to find some great guys. Um, we have a lot of guys from Maine, and they do an excellent job, so I'm happy with that. I'm pretty strict about um, people being drug-free and stuff like that, so, you know, that makes it harder sometimes, but um, I manage. Can I ask a question? Yes. <laughs> so it's back on the, the mother thing. So would you encourage your daughter to go fishing? Uh, probably not. It's going to be like my father. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a hard life. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I decided to do this, but I was talking to my father about it one time. He was a truck driver. Mm -hmm. And he oh. said, well, sometimes you choose your job and sometimes your job chooses you. That's true. Oh. <laughs> that explains it. Yeah. <laughs> I never imagined that I would be doing this. When when I started, I told Dave, I'm only doing this for five years tops. And he's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but you get addicted to the water and the money and to make, you know, you don't have to work a lot of the year and you work when you work and then you're off when you're off. And it's kind of nice. You don't, you're not at a nine to five dealing with corporate stuff or any of that. So there's a lot of freedom to the job that makes it worthwhile. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that used to be like something I enjoyed because like when I was doing it, you didn't you have phones or anything. So right. when you left the dock, mm -hmm. that was it. You knew for seven days, nobody was bothering you. Yeah. <laughs> out there, you weren't getting, I mean, if something bad happened, you could you'd get a hold of people, but in general, it was just seven days. Or, the, the reduction in crew was strictly for reduction in production? Yeah, that was part of the regulations. So in the old days, typically, they would take 12 or 13 mm -hmm. crew. Right. And interestingly, at older boats, I mean, I'm assuming you have berths enough to probably flew Not, quite a few or no? We, we only have nine, nine bunks, yeah. So. But with the watches, I mean, <clears throat> people would... That's called hot bunking. Oh, is it? You have a dirty and it's not, <laughs> not something we want. I've heard people make it. Oh, God. Kind of gross. I wouldn't want to do that. So I'm curious. Um, we have a, in our little galley area, we have a sea stories listening station, and it has unusual catch stories, and it has weather stories, and then it has workplace prank stories. Have either of you ever experienced, you know, has anyone ever played a prank on your boat or played a prank on you? I did one to my ex-husband that wasn't very nice. Did you want to share? For real. So, so in the, the way the, the, the boat was set up, um, so this was on when we were on our little one, it was called the Little Dreamer, and if you went down into the galley, there was like this little um, area that you could climb out of if you were small enough, and I was small enough. So he was steaming at, you know, like towing at night, and you're out, you're not near anything, it's black, it's pitch black, there's nothing. So I crawled up out of there, and then I went and I just bang, jumped onto the uh, house window, like nearly gave him a heart attack. And I thought it was yeah. freaking funny when I did it. He wasn't nearly as amused by the whole event. So. So, but he used, to, he used to do some stuff to me, too, so. Just, he couldn't fit out that little spot, though. <laughs> and a lot of times I think it's to kind of to teach a lesson. I mean, if you listen to the stories over there, it's it a way to but, teach a lesson. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just kind of to be a little mean, I guess, really, if I think back on it. <laughs> Maybe he did something earlier that aggravated me. I don't know. But really. And sure you were bored and you needed something. Could have been. Yeah. Could have been. I always wanted to just entertain myself in some way. <laughs> Oh. I'm trying to think of, I haven't really had any pranks on, but I've heard stories in the older days of people doing stuff. Nowadays, somebody might steal somebody's knife or hide it or silly stuff. Or, um, other things people would do to cheat when they were cutting, like they, they'd put a Coke can in, in their bucket so that it would make it make their bucket fill up faster. And pretend they were keeping up with everybody, and fill their bucket full of water dump it early, try to cheat, keeping up with the guys cutting. And when she's talking about cutting, we're talking about opening every single scallop. So in case you didn't know, scallops are shucked or cut out at sea. And the boat is not just sitting quietly in calm water while you're doing it, from what I understand. Not that I've yeah. ever been there, but. I think that's most of why it's such a tough job, because you're already doing a physically demanded or demanding repetitive task of just standing you stand, you do not sit all the time, just shucking scallops, and you're trying to go as fast as you can. It's very hard work. Um, it takes years to really build up your arm, arm and wrist strength and speed. And um, then add on the ocean to that. So you're doing this while constantly moving, and you're trying to stand in one spot. So your legs are constantly moving. And especially you're like up in the wheelhouse, and the higher up on the boat you are, the more you move. So I strap myself in up there because sometimes you hit a big sea and I won't fly off the deck. So oh, it's been a little sketchy sometimes. And that's the other thing is, you know, if anybody's ever seen Deadliest Catch, we years ago we had a couple captains from the Deadliest Catch come. This was back during the Working Waterfront Festival, and Chris Wright, who's in the picture there in the orange shirt in the center. Mm -hmm. um, is a, a New Bedford scallop captain, and he was on. St we wanted a New Bedford captain on stage with these two guys from the Deadliest Catch. And when it got to be Chris's turn to talk, he said, "You know, you guys just like sit in the wheelhouse and yell at people. We do everything. We have to cut scallops. Mm -hmm. I mean, so on a New Bedford scallop boat, she's cooking, she's navigating, <laughs> she's dealing with a crew, she's cutting scallops. I'm sure there are other things that I'm not listing, but 
you know, it's not, captains don't just hang out in the wheelhouse and mm -hmm. bark oh, Unless you're not catching it. Yeah, yeah well then, <laughs> and then you don't want to be in the wheelhouse. Right. <laughs> and you're sitting there, oh, where's this called? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I don't smoke, so I have no stress relief. I'm just there to stare at the computer, like, come on. But, yeah. So other questions? This is a rare opportunity, I would say. How do you decide where to go fish? Mm, uh, like say if I have a closed area trip, well, I have to get that done. Right. I decide where to go. Like um, earlier in the season, we tend to say that the scallops come around in the west first and move east. Huh. That has to do with their life cycle. Uh -huh. um, when they get close to spawning, the meats swell up and get bigger and firmer. So mm. the, you're going to get more pounds for the number of scallops you catch and they're better quality and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times we'll do our Western trips earlier in the okay. year and then do our Eastern trips later on okay. in the year or it depends if you hear of a hot open area spot and we'll go there before it's all gone or um, there's closures of areas from certain dates. So like you have to get your George's Bank closed area two trip finished for you tour. I think it's August 15th. Okay. So you have to, plan your year a little bit, mm -hmm. but usually my plans never work out. <laughs> you can never plan anything in fishing. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it's pointless, but I kind of have a rough outline of what I want to do for the year. Uh -huh. And then you, some years you have a major problem, like you blow a winch, and huh. you have to fish the whole year with one dredge, which was my last year. <laughs> oh. Or another year, the engine room caught on fire at the dock, so we were out for two months. Just oh, prime summertime fishing, we had to sit at home. So sometimes that's yeah. the years you end up having to fish all winter long, which oh, you don't wow. want to do because the boat didn't cooperate. Uh -huh. or, so it depends. Every really year's different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, did you, the ladies who laughed you off the boat, did you ever encounter them? It was actually the guys that laughed me off. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, they had a full crew anyway, but they just kind of looked who's this 19 year old what are you doing over here but i'm that's typical it's a male dominated industry there's a lot on the cheese mill and <laughs> yeah it's it's part of it you just have to have thick skin i guess yeah when we like years ago boats wouldn't tie up next to us Huh. Because they were women with bad luck, they shouldn't be on the boat. So they were some that just wow. like mm -mm, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So. And you've talked that about, has changed. Would you share the other uh, superstition that you mentioned when we were well? So years talk. ago, so they um, and it's not every boat, don't. But there were enough that didn't really want to be around you. Um, but they used to have they used to have this woman called Fishman Mary that they felt brought good luck and she peed in the fish hole. Um, <laughs> however, we couldn't even tie up next to them. We should off it, hey, I'll urinate in your fish hole. Right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we off at that. Um, uh, no, and I don't think it really brought them luck. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. At the time, I had a huge chip on my shoulder, and I was a mousy little brat, so I probably had it coming. <laughs> well, probably, my boyfriend probably said he still had <laughs> Hey, that attitude gets you somewhere, I guess. <laughs> so climate change is, uh, has pushed the hot lobster in farther north because of the warm, warm waters. Is there a problem with scallops being there? I think that remains to be seen. The only thing that I have noted is, well, two things. Um, there's started to be uh, worms coming into some of the southernmost areas, infecting the scallops down there. Um, and it's pretty pervasive. I think it has to do with the warming water. I don't know what the science says. Um, and the other thing is, I've been noticing the spawning times have started getting pretty unpredictable. Like, it used to be like clockwork, west to east, yada yada. But now it's like, oh, there's this is, there's scallops and George's bank going out right 
going up right now and it's like February, like what, what is this? This is not normal. So it seems a little bit unpredictable in the last few years, I think. Um, Martha, and then we'll go to you. Are these worms, are they parasitic, or are they competing for habitat? Or? I think they're parasitic. I don't really know a lot about do you it. Know, do you know what kind they are? I don't. I don't know the name. Mm -hmm. Wow. And when you say south, like? It's way down Lake Delmarva. They actually yeah. stopped making us go down there because it was mm. pointless. So. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I just wanted to know if throughout your fishing um, trips, like if you've noticed an increase in like weights, you know, like plastics, things like that, during your trips. Hmm. I see a lot of balloons. We, I've been noticing a lot more balloons out there <laughs> for like maybe the last three or four years. I don't know if it was just me, but there's a lot of balloons out there lately. That's where um, all the balloons have gone. I know like, people release them at graduations and stuff, and that's where they end up every time um i don't know really if there's more than before it's you know used to be like so they used to dump trash off of like new york's coast and there's certain parts on the chart where it actually says dump site mm -hmm. yep. oh, yeah, and well, that's that's it's kind of sludge. funny because when you're fishing in those areas like it has a weird smell oh yeah, yeah. And well, that's so over time, I think it, sludge, yeah, yeah, it wears away, but you it's definitely a, notice, like, okay, this is <laughs> gross. And besides but. balloons, have you pulled up, either of you pulled up anything kind of noteworthy, interesting? Well, we used to fish New Year's Eve, you, we would fish Boston Harbor, and that was, you know, they eventually shut it down because it was so polluted. And we would literally be fishing right near the sewerage. Oh, and you, I wouldn't even begin to tell you some of the stuff you brought up. That was disturbing. Yeah, it was really gross. And the fish were like these really thick things. It was really not probably a good place to be fishing, but they allowed it. And that was like so, so soberly cold because you're not way offshore and you, the closer you are to shore, the colder. Yeah. Well, your anniversary was Menemption, New Year's Eve was in Boston. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Where are we going? We're going to fish Boston yeah. Lava. And that would be way, because you'd be in the pallet house towing. Um, in the planes would be like oh, yeah, so close cool. that they'd be like blipping across your radar and you'd be like, oh God, is, that, is the boat coming quick? Is that, no, it's just another plane, but they were so low that you'd see them on your radar. Wow. And so that was, you were cool. doing a remedial service for the country. Huh? <laughs> you were doing a remedial <laughs> service for the country. Yeah. Did you get to see a lot of whales when you were out? At times, yeah. Um, one time I was steaming home and they were just everywhere. They must have been mating or something. It was crazy. Everywhere you walked, there was whale spouts. So it was cool. Um, seen a couple of uh, big ones jump in at a distance. I assume it would be blue whale or something. I don't know. But you see a lot of humpbacks. Okay. Yep, yeah, lots of them. Yeah. They like to come. Um, they'll be traveling in their pod and they like to come to the boat and play with the wig and yeah. that. Oh. Yeah, so they'll cross the oh. water and I like to go out there and make noises at them and they'll look up at you and squeak. And oh. <laughs> oh. Do they eat the parts of the scallop that go back in the ocean? A lot too? of fish do, um, especially sharks. They mm. follow you around. Of course, if you're towing, you got constant seagulls following you. It's, there's a lot of wildlife, for sure. <laughs> Too. Yeah, that is cool. Mm -hmm. It breaks up the monotony a little bit. Yeah. Oh, look at all the sharks, and everybody can go take a break and go look at all the sharks. <laughs> Thank you. So I have a question. What um, advice would either of you give to either a woman who wants to get into specifically into commercial fishing, or just try something that's kind of um, perceived to be uh, a male occupation? Um, I would strongly encourage girls to get into fishing. My grandbaby had bought her first set of fish boots before she was even born. She's already got a set of oil gear, just waiting for her. So I would. I just think it's, I don't know. And what but advice would you It's in our blood. Yeah. Like it really is. It's just, I just, I don't know. My whole family has done it. And um, not for lack of, like I said, my brother, I also lost two grandfathers at sea. So it's not as if I don't know that the profession is a difficult one and that there are things that can go wrong. But there's just, I don't know, there's something, 
And, you know, growing up, I mean, you didn't have the experience because your whole fit, nobody, you know, and it was always like, oh, the fishermen, they're a bunch of drunks, they're a bunch of this. And I used to get so aggravated. Maybe they do drink a little more stuff, but it's a totally different lifestyle. You're out there, you're, it's really, really hard work. You, so, and the other thing is, I think you have to be a little different to want to do it. You can't be your average bear, right? You just wouldn't do it. But um, I would, I would encourage my granddaughter to go out, whether it's, I don't know if my son and daughter might maybe just stay boat fishing. I think you would, right? You'd be all right with Remy if that's what, yeah. So if she decided to do it, I'm sure that Remy would be, and I'd like to be right outside, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of funny, really, with the like, college stuff, because my oldest son did go to college, and now he's commercial fishing, and my youngest son went straight to fishing, um, and like at a young age, but, but I would. I don't know about you. You yeah. said you wouldn't encourage your daughter. Because <laughs> it is a hard life. It is. But it depends on the woman. Just not all men can be fishermen. Hundred percent. And not all women can be fishermen. Mm -hmm. But I think if you can do the work and you're willing to put yourself through the physical tr trial of it, um, yeah, go for it. It's a good job. It pays really well. It's a nice lifestyle sometimes, but it it has its downsides. It's dangerous, mm -hmm. and I mean, it's especially on a woman's body, it's very hard on your body. Um, so you just have to be made of steel, I guess. <laughs> I, I still don't know why I'm doing it, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So do you have a, a plan for the future? Do you, do you feel like, okay, I'm going to do it another so, so many years? I don't. I have no idea. <laughs> Someday I'd like to do something else because I'm going to get to a point where it's going to get more and more painful the older I get to do it. But at the moment I need that I have, I've made it to a comfortable income and stuff and I have to maintain that so it's kind of like what else what else could I do that I can make that same money at mm -hmm. at this point uh -huh. you'd be starting out from scratch in a new career it's like doesn't really make a lot of sense mm -hmm. so you kind of I'm kind of stuck with it right now mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a love-hate relationship is what I always mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. <clears throat> what was your next trip um, next week. Um, Where are you going? I'm going to go to Lightship South. Which Where? Is, uh, Nantucket Lightship South. Okay. Um, very, very tiny little scallops. <laughs> Nobody wants to go there, but that's what we have to do. Uh -huh. How long will you be out? Um, I have 17,000 pounds to get, so probably going to have to do two trips to get it, because um, I'm here and it's pretty slow. Mm -hmm. Mm. And that's a closed area then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then our new days come back April 1st, so I'll have a whole new set of trips with new days to go. Yeah. Um, if someone did want to like get into fishing, let's say like as a summer job, how would you recommend they like go about that? Same as everybody else. Same as I did and just go. Not the same as me. Don't, <laughs> <ask you> that. <laughs> hey, if you Don't recommend on, that. If you can get on for a connection, do it. Do whatever you're going to do to get on. That's a lot of the guys, that's how they get on boats, is through family or friends or connections. That's a lot of a lot of the way you get a job, it's through connections. So if you have that, go for it. If you don't know anybody, then just walk the docks and maybe somebody will give you a chance. But um, I think uh, Chris Solon, she started out doing, I think, mechanics work and stuff um, around fishing uh, industry and was able to work her way in that way. And now she's a mate. So, um, however you can get in, <laughs> it's a hard industry to get into because it, you know, there's not as many jobs available as there used to be. And mm -hmm. There's a lot of people um, looking for the same job. So, it's really mm -hmm. just proving yourself and a lot of people will try it and few will continue mm -hmm. and make it. Mm -hmm. Are there any women doing lobstering offshore? Absolutely. Um, I don't know about Massachusetts, but I'm from Maine, Maine, Maine yeah. there's tons of women in Maine. Yeah. Oh, is it Linda Greenlaw who moved in Maine? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and if you missed my introduction, um, a week from tomorrow, we're having a Zoom program and you can virtually meet 10 to 12 women who are lobstering in Maine. So that should be interesting. Yeah. 
um, I know that during COVID, um, uh, the, uh, a lot of uh, fishing boats started to be, because the, the business of the restaurants fell away, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the uh, fishing boats started to sell directly to consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, do you also, did you do that too, or what was the experience like? I didn't, um, we weren't set up for that. Uh, I think I did one trip and then the price plummeted and we took a little break and waited until mm -hmm. it came up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it was just it was so low that it wasn't worth mm -hmm. you couldn't pay for your fuel or anything so it wasn't worth wasting you, you only have so much trips you can do mm -hmm. so um we waited a little while and when we went back out they had risen enough to go mm -hmm. it, we definitely took a hit that year are you um anticipating the events happening in ukraine to have an impact just in terms of the sanctions and the rising price Plus of fuel, fuel and yeah the fuel is Crazy. I think they told me five dollars and thirteen cents a gallon for marine diesel. Mm -hmm. What were you paying hurt. last year? I don't actually know exactly, but it wasn't that much. <laughs> but um, sometimes, like I know when we were paying a lot for fuel in another year, the scallop price was also high, so it balanced out. I'm hoping that the same happens this year. It's, it's record prices. This, mm -hmm. this winter and mm -hmm. still, so mm -hmm. that's a good same. thing. I think of my salary to get, and then yes. my son can stuff, I'm like, whoa, it's yeah. nuts. Even when I started, we were getting $6 a pound. Mm -hmm. and so <laughs> boats came in this winter. And what are you getting in? They came in with 30, mm -hmm. $34, $35 a pound yeah. for the wow. big scallops awesome. this winter. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. My father would have hated so much time that job. He might be like, hey, this is a fun job. Yeah. like a portion of what the boat makes? A great question. Yeah, you want to explain how payment So I think each company is a little bit different, but my company um, is more old school. Um, so the captain may. Uh, engineer, they get a small percentage off the top, um, and then the the stock gets divided into boat share and crew share. And the boat pays for a lot of expenses like insurance, dockage, um, repairs, maintenance of the boat, and all of the equipment. And he pays for gear as well. Um, and then the crew pays for what you need to make a trip: fuel, ice, food labor if we have somebody else build our gear for us we pay the labor of that um, and then um, that portion gets divvied up however many guys are on the boat so seven or eight ways and then that's your that's your check it's very old you know old-fashioned i mean it's like a holdover from the whaling era mm -hmm. so it's one of the few jobs i'm aware of where you're not earning an hourly wage you're not earning a salary you really don't know from one trip to the next, mm -hmm. um, you know, if there's an engine breakdown, mm -hmm. yeah. that's going to hit everybody hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. If that but happens, if you do well, yeah. If just, say if something breaks down like the first or second day, you don't have enough to pay for the basic expenses yet. Um, sometimes we'll just wait and do the settlement, wait till the boat's fixed, go back out, and then do a, do a settlement on the full trip. Then it depends what the situation is. So. Sometimes you go out and you take a loss, so that doesn't happen very often, but. <laughs> I remember my father, oh, and the boat, we came mm -hmm. in one trip as a little girl. He said, I had to cancel. No. No was the motto. Because by the time you go out, you've already put in at least a day of work, of hard yeah, work. It was a whole trip. Right. You know, that was not good. So is there um, camaraderie among, I mean, there are not many women offshore fishing that I know of in the New Bedford area. There's you and there's um, Crystal who is fishing now, otherwise she wouldn't have yeah. been here tonight. She'll be back tomorrow. Um, it, so do you, do you talk with each other? Do you get together Crystal all? and I talk, yep. Um, I don't think we've actually met in person before. Well, she's not either. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't really know anybody else. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I would hire somebody. I actually talked to a girl, she's dragging and she wants to get into scalloping. I was like, well, get some practice on the day boats. And she was, 
she was saying she was gonna go on the day boats and learn how to cut. I was like, yeah, I'll take you shocker this year and teach you if you're willing to work. And so I'm all, I'm open to it. What makes a good fisherman? Scalloping, I would say, is very mental. Um, it's not, it's physical, but it's all about having the strength of mind to make yourself endure the conditions and the work and persevere. And a lot of, I've seen big, big tough guys are uh, lacrosse players, but they are all that and they get on the boat and they just literally cry. <laughs> like they were seasick. <laughs> weather and they didn't want to cut anymore. I mean, I've seen them leaning against the rock, cutting backwards, and they were just, they were done. <laughs> um, Dave said he saw somebody like lay down on the floor and just cry like a baby one time. So, <laughs> so being a big tough guy does not necessarily mean you're going to be a good fisherman. So. If it's some of the psychological thing, not being mm -hmm. able to see land yep. really makes That's a lot of people nervous. Out. It does. It's like okay, so what's under here? The ocean and not seeing. Yeah, some people are. Some people don't like not being able to talk to their family or mm -hmm. um, just being away and not knowing when you're coming home. Just well, there's a lot of mental pieces. Mm -hmm. And what about the adjustment when you do get home? I'm guessing that must be challenging. Yeah, I mean, I I say I have my zombie day and just sleep. <laughs> you know, you're catching up on a week of sleep. It's pretty. Feel like you got hit by a truck. You just back up. <laughs> well, I'm afraid my daughter. It's like I walked in the door and there's a baby. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> not a lot of rest here. <laughs> How old is she now? Six. <laughs> so if you have one of those two people go down, or if you have a crew person go down, the other members of the crew have to pick up the slack and, and do the cutting. I mean. <laughs> Well, you, they get cut. It's kind of one of those, if somebody turns in, it's what you call it, if somebody quits mid-trip, they turned in. Sometimes um, it's for a medical reason or sometimes they just, they're done. Um, it's a very bad, bad, bad thing to do. It wrecks your reputation. Um, and that happens and then their morale just goes down the toilet. Everybody, nobody wants to work. They're not going to pick up somebody's slack who's going to get the same paycheck as them. So, usually, you just have to go home and cut your losses. It's very unfortunate when that happens. But sometimes people keep going, but this depends. Like, if you're almost finished your closed area trip, it's like, okay, let's just finish it and then go home, be done with it. Any other questions? We used to fish alongside Oli ah, many years ago. That note. And this is Oli Anderson, if you don't already know. One of the men on the veteran fishermen in our. Well, I have survived for many years. I think the oldest fisherman will be 94. Yes. Woo! Yeah. Um, so I think we're going to bid you adieu. Um, I'm sure that these lovely ladies will stick around for a few minutes with people. Thank you. Thank you to both Kimmy and Jessica. Um, if you haven't seen our women's exhibit, it, you can take a few minutes now. It'll be up through June, as I said. Please join us next Friday by Zoom for the event uh, that's coming up. Uh, if you're not already on our e-news list, um, we invite you to sign in at the front desk. We'd love to let you know what's going on. We do a lot of programming, and now that the um, you know COVID is starting to recede, we'll be doing a lot more. So we've got concerts coming up, um, talks, lectures, tours, all kinds of stuff, films, and so on. So thank you so much for coming, and we'll see you again soon. Yay! Bye.